This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Thou shall have no other gods before me. And we think that means Jesus first, these other gods second, third, fourth, and fifth, right? That's not what it's saying here. Before me is one Hebrew word, panim. Now, if you remember when I was teaching on Abraham, that he was to walk with God, panim and tamim was in the Hebrew. God says, Come walk before me. Come walk with me. We're going to do this thing together. From the moment you got saved, God is walking with you. And he's trying to transform you from Abram to Abraham, from a Babylonian to a prince of God. And so what he is saying is, don't stick these things in my face as we're walking together because you like them more than you like me. It is hard in this day to find the real Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to say this. You know, one of the things about God, you see, God is unchangeable. He is exactly the same He was before He created the universe. He'll be exactly the same that He ever was in the new heaven and new earth. One of the attributes of God is that He is unchangeable. The cross did not change God. The cross changed us so that we could be adopted by God and be compatible with Him. Okay? He is an absolute fixed point that cannot change. Unlike all the pagan gods. And when we start to try to remold him in the image of Adonis or Hercules or whatever, Molech the prosperity god. It's all about how much money you jingle in your pocket. Well, I tell you what, you can have enough money to weigh down ships and you're going to leave it all as you burn in hell. Just truth. You can even pastor 20,000 people in a mega church and lead them and you to hell if you don't have you had not accepted and declare the real Jesus. One of the attributes of God, we sang it today, He is thrice holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. That is the supreme apt attribute of God. And kadosh literally means the absolute other. That you see everything in the world and you see all the gods and you see the sin going on, the craziness going on. He is absolutely separate and other than that and his other is unchangeable. And I'm getting sick and tired of when I teach on this, I'll have Christians go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and says, no, God's greatest attribute is love. Corinthians 13 has nothing to do with the attributes of God. It has to do with a new birth in you, sweetie. In you, there is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love because you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind. With all of you. That's why it endures. 
not the limp-wristed, everything goes Jesus that the, that the world's preaching. That is not Jesus. And even the first time he came as Messiah ben Joseph, he said, I've not come this time to judge the world. How many know that that's the next time, which is like right around the corner? At the same time, he called religious leaders snakes and vipers, and he cleared out the money changers twice in the temple with a bullwhip. That's my kind of Jesus. Oh, I could go through a lot of rabbit holes, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave them all right now. We may, that may be a whole new series. Listen, thou shalt have no other gods in my face. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, there is that the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And thou shalt not bow down to them to serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Imagine. You deliver somebody, you clean them up, you give them your name, and they start kissing somebody else's feet like somebody else did it. How would that make you feel? And giving all the credit to somebody else. As a human, you wouldn't tolerate that for a moment, would you? If it cost you everything to get them free. And God is not going to hold those that, that have made modern idols in the Christian church. He is not going to hold them guiltless because they're not bearing his name while they claim that they are. He says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third or fourth generation. Now listen to, what he, now listen to the way he says it. When you change who I am... And you make it more palatable for your carnal nature, you just prove that you hate me. No wonder modern preachers don't like the Ten Commandments. They can't even get past the first one. Okay? And if there are any grammar place out there, first one. I'm speaking Ozarkian right now. They can't even get past the first one. I've literally heard people when they look at the cross and look at the blood and what Jesus did for us and look at what's coming in the book of Revelation, I have literally seen them post on the internet, I will not serve a God like that. Then you, my friend, are lost, you're going to hell, and you are not a Christian. Quit lying to everybody around you to include yourself. I came loaded for bear today. But listen to what he says, And I show mercy unto, unto thousands of them, that love me and keep my commandments. What did Jesus say? If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. We need to move away from Marcionism, which was declared a heresy by the early church. Polycarp called Marcion the firstborn son of Satan. So maybe you shouldn't draw your doctrine from him who taught that Jesus was a separate God from the Old Testament and that Jesus conquered Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh. Verse 7, And thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now he's warning us again, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. In vain. Now, what this expresses in the Hebrew is the way that you live, the way that you worship, the things that you do are either making God's name glorious in the earth or you're making them vain. And much of the church today has made the name of Jesus empty, powerless, no longer transforms, no longer is respected. They don't respect who he is. They don't respect his name. They, they open up basically when they start putting their churches together. What do people want? And they take a piece of Play-Doh and they work it up into the Jesus that everybody likes. You like this idol? You like this idol? Let's go ahead and build a church around it. I am an ambassador. I have been sent by him. He is unchangeable. Either you line up with him and his kingdom, or you're, on, you're of the other kingdom and you're headed to hell. Oh. Guys, like Abraham, we are walking with God. As we walk with him, we are instructed not to place idols, i.e. watchers, Nephilim, and the lies about him other men say in his face. Do you think for a moment, if you had a family member that was lying about you and trashing your name, how many of you would really feel compelled to bless them? 
I tell you what, nothing shuts up God's purse of blessing quicker than you lying about him, misrepresenting him, and trashing his name to everybody you know. And then, why am I not blessed? Why am I not blessed? Why am I not blessed? Your ugly mouth is why you're not blessed in the ugly way that you're living. And you, you're a rebellious child claiming to live in the household of God. But yet you're living like your old father, the devil. There's no reverence. There's no respect. Your level of blessing is determined by how much you line up with him, not trying to force him to line up with you. I'm going to get a lot of emails about this, but you know what? That's why there are two delete keys on my keyboard. The God of the Bible is unique from all other pagan gods. He does not change. He is holy. He is righteous. And he tells us who he is instead of leaving it to the imagination of vain men. And we are to proclaim that. But look at what's going on today. We have the hyper grace Jesus. It's all okay. Just feel better about yourself in your old stinky ways. It's okay. We don't want you to be made feel bad no matter how honor you're living. You can even serve other gods and be serving the devil. Come with a big pentagram on top of your head. But we just want to make you feel loved and send you to hell after you leave this place because you've not been confronted by sin and the truth of who God really is. And the pagans look at that and say, Oh, Jesus we do the same thing Constantine did. Jesus was just another form of Mithra. Blasphemous. Just another form of Tammuz or Apollo. Uh-uh. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the creator and all humanity is answerable to him. He's 100% right. We're 100% wrong. And until we fall on our knees and surrender to him... How many know you got a hot future ahead of you? Forever. Well, how about the prosperity, Jesus? It's all about money. How do I know you're walking with God? Show me the money. And then you have an attitude, what have you done for me lately? Let me tell you something. If God doesn't do another thing in my life, except what he did for me in the cross, and the day that he picked me up and put me in his arms and he called me son, I don't need another thing. Everything else is gravy. And yet we're still like Jacob trying to find that formula, trying to connive this and connive that. Jacob means surplanter, conniver. It's because you've not really wrestled with God until he gets his hands on you and you sense his embrace. You're a conniver. There have been times I, I have read online of this whole adoption process, especially you know, there's times when they get to go and they get to visit the children, even if they're real little, so they kind of get to know them. And then so that day is really a wonderful day. But sometimes it's not always that way. Sometimes it's, it's you've been rejected, you've been left. This one is now coming and you don't know them. But you have been told, this is going to be your father, this is going to be your mother, but all you know is rejection. And so when that child is first picked up, it's like this. And they start loving and kissing and holding, and the child begins to ease up as the spirit of adoption takes hold. There's no fighting. There's no put me down, it's pick me up. Time. I got time. I'm watching the timer. Worship is when you go up before the throne and you do this. That's why we lift our hands in worship. Pick me up, Daddy. I've had a rough week. Pick me up. I've had a rough time. Pick me up. And when the presence of God comes into our service, that's the embrace of the Father. I've got tears on my own glasses this morning. Made myself cry. Until you get there, you've not done worship. We have so watered down the gospel, so watered down the kingdom, that what I'm preaching today is going to offend many 
And I will give you a hint. I don't care. I don't want to offend my father and the price that he paid for our salvation and for us to come in the kingdom. And I want to set the record straight that there is a weight of responsibility of bearing his name in the earth. And it is time for us to fall on our knees, open up this book, the full Bible. The Bible starts in Genesis, not Matthew. You go from Genesis to Revelation. And the interesting thing I find about Revelation is the Jesus of Revelation sure looks like the God of the Old Testament. He is a man of war. He has a glittering sword. He can send down one angel to rumble and how many know it's all over for hundreds of thousands. And he didn't even blink when he did it. Because they were coming after family. Whew! The modern evangelical church is guilty of idolatry. The emergent church movement, this church movement, that church movement, even the Jewish roots movement is guilty when they get so caught up in Judaico worship that they lose sight of Jesus. They are guilty of idolatry. I told you, I'm going to make everybody mad because I'm representing Him. We have slowly and methodically reimagined God to accommodate our carnality. We are guilty of forming a new golden calf from the prosperity of Laodicea in America. And there is no other way to say that. Except maybe stronger. In fact, I heard one prophet years ago talking about the two golden calves of the northern tribes, and he called them Catholicism and Protestantism. Something to make you ponder. Catholicism is a hybridism. There's no difference between them and the Masons who do the abomination of uniting Jehovah, Osiris, and Baal, calling him Jebelon. How many know the Catholic Church had their own pantheon? How do they have a pantheon? They venerate saints which Augustine drew from paganism, and that when a Nephilim died and could still influence humanity, he was worshipped. The Baal at Mount Carmel was Hercules. And so Constantine looked at that and borrowed from paganism. And now we have veneration of saints. How many know they are the great witness that goes before us and there's to be our example? But nowhere in the Word do you pray to anybody but Almighty God. We have access by Jesus and His blood unto the Father. So that we may come boldly before the throne of grace. I don't need the Apostle Paul. I don't need to talk to the Apostle Paul. I don't need to talk to Mary. I don't need to talk to... I need to talk to Jesus. I tell you what, not only do I need to have a little talk with Jesus, Jesus is getting ready to say it to a lot of people, I need to have a little talk with you. And they're not going to like it. You see, Exodus 20, 1 through 7 are all connected. Yahweh Elohim is the God who delivered you. Do not draw from paganism or carnal desires to fashion another God. Do not put these false gods in my face by creating them, worshiping, or declaring to others that they're me. That's the Ten Commandments, this first part. I will hold you responsible that do it. And when you do and you make my name vain in the earth, I will hold you responsible for doing that as well. That's the first part of the Ten Commandments. No wonder sinful preachers want to say that the Ten Commandments are not for today. And what happens eventually, they use it as an excuse, not for this first part, but they like to lie and steal and commit adultery and a lot of other things. They want to do away with those too. So you want to live like the devil and think you're in the kingdom. Jesus said, when you're not salt and light in the earth, you have lost your savor. You will be trodden under the feet of men. The church in America today is being trodden under the feet of men because we kept, we stopped representing the God of the Bible. And we started preaching gods of our own fashion that our own carnality could handle. 
So much so that in some movements it's about becoming gods. Or I'm a king and I'm going to act like it. You may be a king's kid, but that doesn't make you a king. In Revelation, it's a poor translation. It should be rendered kingdom of priests, which is what God told Israel. What he, he said, I would that you be a kingdom of priests, but because you rejected my voice, let's go ahead and take Aaron and his boys and, and, and the sons of Levi, and we're going to establish a priesthood. But plan A was kingdom of priests, because we're all his representative of the kingdom. Therefore, what I believe and let me tell you something, if you're not living it, you can speak it all day long, but you don't believe it. Because living is the proof of your believing. It's the walk and not the talk. And how we walk and how we conduct ourselves declares whether we're bearing the name of God or not. You see, unless you take the weight and understanding of the weight of bearing His name, as well as the responsibility for that, you will never be able to move in the power of the name. Some will say, well, you just haven't developed faith in the name of Jesus. No. It's that you haven't learned how to live like Jesus. And you don't re Why should the devil respect the name coming out of your lips when you yourself don't respect his name or what his commandments are? The devil looks at you and say, says, you're on my side. Why are you using the other guy's name against me for it has no authority? If it doesn't have authority in your life, it won't have authority over the demon that you're trying to use it against. Let me tell you something. When you start seeing from second and third heaven realities, the enemy can see through you. You are transparent. They can read you like a book. While you have convinced yourself that you're all right. They see that demon sitting on your shoulder that's controlling your every movement and telling you it's okay because grace made it okay. They can look at you and see if you're in their camp. Why is that? Because you are butt naked on the battlefield. The character where the, only the armor of God can be placed where the character of Christ has been established. Paul deals with this in Ephesians. You've got to put off before you can put on. When you put on Christ, the armor goes with it. You're naked on the battlefield holding a stick. The devil convinces you that it's a sword. And you got a demon on your shoulders whispering into your ears. And the enemy looks at you and laughs. But what he fears is when he meets somebody on the battlefield that's bearing the name of God. That upon his breastplate, it says, I serve Yahweh Elohim in him alone. I keep his commandments, the fire of God's on the inside of my heart. The Roman helmet didn't have a face plate like they did in medieval times. So you could look your enemy in the eyes. And he looks in your eyes and he sees the fire of Jesus in your eyes. How many knows the fear of God in you begins to hit the enemy on the battlefield? He already knows all you got to do is hold your ground, and he's lost. Because the minute you begin to buckle under the pressure he puts you in, all of a sudden the Father's hand reaches down from heaven and puts his hand on your shoulder, and he hears a voice saying, you messing with my kid? You messing with one that's really tried to represent me in the earth and is bearing my name and it has bared the weight. You think the weight of your tribulation is going to overcome the weight in God's weight training room of him learning to bear the weight of my name. My kid's got some muscles and I'm about ready to breathe a second wind into him. Then God can sit back and smile and tell the devil, you're about to see something really special. <laughs> Because he's getting ready to open up a can, a whoop devil on you. And just to make sure it happens, I just put an extra unction of the Holy Ghost all over him. And a little extra fire in him to do it. So that every time he hits you with the word, you feel the weight of the name that he has been established in. See why I'm doing this first? You got to get it established in the old before you can understand it in the new. Because we're going to have to learn the gravity 
the seriousness of bearing the name of God in the earth because God wants to load you for bear to win the last day's harvest into the kingdom. That's what we've been all called to. And Father, for the remnant everywhere, Father, anywhere in the earth that this message goes, Father, I ask for an anointing for them to just get hungry for you, to learn the real you, to learn who their new heavenly father really is, to learn what this family business is all about, how the family conducts itself, and how it bears its, his name in the earth. Fire build, father, build a fire in the remnant. Father, let them have the extra oil of the Holy Spirit. Father, a fresh anointing. And Father, let them be transformed as instead of wrestling with you, they just simply yield to the embrace and settle on into the family. And Father, we thank you. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering Heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com that's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.